You know, I was um, I was having a discussion a few uh, weeks ago while I was in Orlando at the uh, amusement arcade show, and um, you know, some of the bankers were asking me, some of the credit guys were asking me the future of cinema, and I said to them, I said, you know, it's it's the it's the biggest contradiction where we talk about online sales uh, when it comes to the retail space, and that is exactly what streaming is to the movie going experience. It's basically online sales. The truth of the matter is, while online sales have been going up, the cost of real estate, commercial real estate, has done nothing else but skyrocket because it's become more and more valuable and because it's can become more and more desirable. And if you look at the retail shopping experience, it has become more of an experience than just branded shopping. And it's the same thing with going to the movies. We all have big TVs at home and we're all going to probably have better sound systems at home than my dad ever had or my grandfather, who I think didn't even have a TV. But we all have kitchens as well. And it hasn't stopped us from going out to restaurants. And even though my mom and my wife are the best Italian cooks I know, I still go to Italian restaurants outside of the house. I think the pandemic has resolved two things. I think the first thing it's resolved is an eternal argument between exhibitors and studios on day and date, what windows we should have, shouldn't have. But what everybody has to agree is there is not one chance in hell any U.S. studio can ever make money off streaming and streaming alone. The other thing that needs to change, you know, I always like to say once you have a 24-inch seat, that you make it 30 inches or you make it 40, doesn't matter. At 24 inches, I'm still floating in the seat. So that you give me extra inches of space, I don't need it. What I do want is a script-based movie. I, I want to go back and reconnect with the story. To what extent have you yourselves, the four of you, uh, and considered a uh, new use, a new relationship between the audience and the screen? Not every movie is worth 12 bucks or $15. The movie going experience would gain frequency and would also gain in um, popularity if it actually learned to create a varied pricing structure, to determine a different pricing, not based on the quality of picture, but based on the reduced window. So, for example, if a movie had a 30 day window, you know, it would, the top price would be, let's say, $8. And if it had a 45 day window, then it would be $10. And if it was, a 90-day window, then it got the full $15, uh, $15, whatever it was, right? My biggest thing as a distributor is, you know, but who's, call, who's deciding this? Like, is it a communal conversation between exhibition and distribution? Because the last thing you want as a distributor is when we see a film that has great value, an exhibition to not be so hot on the film to say, no, we want to discount that price ticket. That's not really going to fly for us, right? Um, but maybe perhaps, I've heard some philosophies out there right now, perhaps you set it on an algorithm. And so it's based on who's buying up the tickets. And if all of a sudden a documentary gets hot at a lower price, then it jumps up, you know, the next week or something like that. I don't think that's something that distribution's opposed to. I think it's something that's, you know, needs to be an ongoing, continued conversation, especially as maybe next November, um, when dynamic booking becomes a thing and you start programming films um, with better showtimes. For example, we had Paw Patrol, which is one of our greatest success stories this year, seven and a half million dollars. Um, CanCon made film. Um, and what we did with it, we recognized that the audience was under the age of five and that they would be asleep by a certain hour. So we booked more matinees than we would have late evenings with exhibition. And exhibition was all for that because it meant that we both were going to be more successful on the title box office wise. 4D, 5D, 6D, 7D, 9D, 11D. <laughs> Dom, please explain to me what's happening with this uh, uh, and uh, what is Christy doing with the, all these. Uh, well, certainly, I, I think everyone knows the difference between 2D and 3D. Usually, I, I think 4D, they add things like shaking seats, or 5D, they blow air at you, or smells, or w whatever. Um, Christy's sort of focused on the, the visual experience and the audio experience right now. Um, so going from 2D to 3D, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room who've walked away from a 3D film 
a little bit dissatisfied with the experience. And, and that's something that, that new technology will address. Um, one of the biggest issues with, with 3D film presentations is that the 3D equipment, it sucks all the light off the screen. It can take up to 75, 80% of the light away. But with new RGB laser technology, you can put in a projector that's far more efficient, far brighter, and, and you can put an actual, a bright screen, uh, a bright display in front of your audience, and they'll enjoy their 3D that much more. So we've seen, uh, yes, the, the, the seats shaking, uh, the, 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 the wind coming, uh, yeah. the thunderstorm. Uh, do you think that this is going to attract a, a new audience or, or audience? It's going to become an amusement park at the theater. When we went digital, so in our case, it cost us about $15 million Thanks, to Vince. convert all of our auditoriums to digital projectors. We were unable to increase the price by a dollar. People were not, customers were not willing to pay more for a digital experience, even though it was a higher quality experience. And that's expected. I'm not paying you for that. that that's what you are. You're a movie theater. You're supposed to give me that. As for the shakiness of the seats, I got to tell you <laughs> the reaction I'm getting from people is if the selling point for your movie is the shaking seats, the snow, and the 3D, it must be a really bad script because that's all you've got. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's the reaction people are getting. Yes, that's yes, it. yes. That's the customer reaction. It's a bit of a gimmick. Vincenzo, you, you are right. I think that the shaking, the spectator, the, 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 the audience, needs to have a shaking inside. The emotion has to be inside, not on the chair. Suddenly you have a new means of distributing foreign uh, products in, uh, in other countries. And so I think that something like that is very key, very important. Now that we have these possibilities, we should use them. What do you think? The more access we have to foreign content, the more enriched we are ultimately. The truth of the matter is there is nothing wrong with making money with Italian comedies, with Italian dramas. I think we need to open up. And, and you know, it's not a secret. When we opened our theaters, my largest theater is 18 screens. My largest auditorium is 400. My smallest is 100. There's a reason for that, right? It's because I know that not documentaries aren't going to need a 300 or 400 seat auditorium. But at 100 seat, they're fine. And they deserve to be played. The whole idea when we built 18 screens wasn't to play 18 of the same movie. It was to play 18 different movies. It was to offer variety. It's to attract the popcorn eating, the coffee drinking, and the no concession guy at the theater. This year, last year, we were forced to uh, reinvent the way to uh, have a festival, and we, we did a drive-in. We, we, we put a drive-in at Ontario Place, uh, it was incredible. We built with Ontario Place a partnership. Uh, we built a big screen uh, mm -hmm. and we had uh, 500 uh, people, even 800 people every night. Uh, but uh, we were screening uh, uh, foreign films with subtitles. And I imagine uh, 50 years ago, with the projector of 50 years ago, it was going to be impossible for a car that was uh, hundreds of meters away from the screen to read. And there's a lot of technology that goes into to putting subtitles on the screen at a, at, at a movie. But certainly drive-ins themselves offer, offer unique challenges because of the sheer size of the screen. So what, what most people or many people don't realize is it, it's, it doesn't matter how far the screen is from the projector, but a big giant screen like a drive-in, you need a big huge projector. And the type of, the type of format we did there was uh, we needed the latest technology to give that screen enough light to make it look, look decent. What about, uh, uh, you know, for sure Canada in particular, with the weather that we have, uh, uh, movie theaters, uh, you know, uh, cannot be uh, in a drive-in all year round. But what do you think the fact that um, in Canada and in all over the world we are living more outside because mm. of the pandemic and probably would like to have probably as in Europe the possibility to enjoy culture and events outside. You see a future in the public screenings outside. Certainly at the start of the pandemic you know the movie theaters stopped calling us for projectors but I was I was fielding multiple inquiries every week from 
from folks who wanted to start up this type of operation, an outdoor, outdoor screening type thing. So you think it is going to be part of the emergency only, or you see it uh, also a trend of the future? I think open air, like I said, presents some challenges to the experience. It's tough to get the audio right, as you probably realized. Um, there's all, all, all sorts of issues with ambient light and screen distances and viewing angles and things like that. I think the, the best place to see a movie would still be in in a, a cinema environment, but certainly, I, I, you know, it's, I've, I've seen a lot of folks experimenting with different things in the last few years. So what do you think, uh, Vincenzo? Do you think that there is a possibility, of course, Canada, Montreal is even worse, the weather there, but uh, think about uh, theaters uh, that are open air, what do you think? If it was a, an open air, like an amphitheater, an open amphitheater, you know, I, I think that comes closer to the in, closed uh, enclosed movie theater experience the fact that you're alone in your car you know you're socializing but you're not what's interesting when you watch a movie in the same room with somebody is for some reason when somebody gets scared they react they yell and then and then you get scared and so and so there's a certain uh, 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 you know uh, going to the movies in a dark room without shaking anybody's hand is the closest thing to social distancing if I could use the expression, you know, created from the pandemic. Going to the drive-in is a campground experience in Quebec. You know, like I came to, to, the, to the event that, uh, that, that you organized for the Italian Film Festival. It was not the same as when I've been to drive-ins in Quebec to see. People actually get out of their cars. They actually have sort of like, you know, long chairs and they sort of sit outside of their car. What they're really looking for is an amphitheater experience. They want to do like a tailgating party, you know, around watching a movie. I still am a big believer of the in, in, uh, in, in, in closed movie theater experience. You could add to that that you, the emotion doesn't cross uh, the metal of the car, That's even right. if windows are open. <laughs> That's right. You know, I think that the, the, the ups and downs that we've seen in, in the movie theater attendance is got more to do with from the laziness of making movies. In other words, everybody likes to say that the hottest thing right now is superhero movies, as if there's never been superhero movies in American movies, but there have. What's changed now is it's easier to make a cookie, you know, and repeat that cookie, you know, like a production line. So what basically is going to happen is Hollywood's going to pump out superhero movies until they don't make money anymore and at that point they're going to start scrambling and saying okay 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 what do people want to see now it's just laziness in saying why do i have to always reinvent the wheel when i can just copy paste and that's where series that's where the experimental side of netflix could be helpful to you know if we look at the movie industry how many times have we said in the movie business uh, time pieces don't work well in movie theaters, but yet fantasy time pieces like Game of Thrones, Harry Potter, those work very well, right? Mm -hmm. So now, how? but those are very expensive to make and they're harder to cookie paste and make. So I don't think, you know, we should be running to annihilate movie theaters and use the boxes for something else. I think what's going to happen is you know, we're going to redefine, you know, and that's why I try and push by saying, can I charge cheaper? Right. I mean, this whole Disney approach of, you know, five shows a day, it doesn't matter that this is frozen and it plays to young under 12 girls. You're still going to have a nine o'clock showing. Doesn't make sense. Right. That's why Paw Patrol was so successful. That's why it played for so long. Is because there was an accommodation on the part of distribution and saying, let's all be serious. There's no reason to have a late show for Paw Patrol. There's no reason to have a nine o'clock show. Should we have a seven? Yes, because, you know, and so there's going to be multiple ways of using the space. So I, I, I'm not necessarily overly looking to modify my theaters. I am looking to have more content in my theaters. But you know, you said before something uh, that was very interesting that you were surprised by the fact that Warner Bros. 
came up with 48 movies instead of their usual 10. Now I understand why that was the case. That's, that must have coincided with the time when the movie house was multiplied in several different uh, viewing rooms. So it, had- it, it, it was for that, but it was also because, you know, a lot of people don't realize how closely knit the movie business is to retail, right? So the first erosion to the windows, the 90-day windows, came from Walmart and Target, right? So there was a movie that was released, and because it ha- we had to meet Black Friday, you know, U.S. Thanksgiving celebrations, that means the movie had to be released on DVD in 84 days. That was the first hit to the window. It was DVD sales and the fact that Walmart and Target represented 95% of the market. I, I was at dinner last night and somebody said to me, you guys are at 100% capacity, right? But movie theaters are very rarely at 100% capacity. So the only benefit of being at 100% capacity is the message that it sends out to people. It's the message that the government believes that if a movie theater were to be 100% full, there would be no risk Mm-hmm. They get sick from the pandemic and so forth and so forth. That's the only benefit of being at 100% capacity. Because the truth of the matter is, last night, I was nowhere close to more than 10% capacity. So I didn't need the other 90. But it's just the perception. And going to the movies, a lot of it is about perception. You know, I think I'm going to love this movie because of the trailer. And therefore, I'm willing to plug down $12 to go watch the movie. So, uh, Vincenzo, tonight we are going to show a movie. Uh, it's a documentary on Dean Martin, and we have a full capacity, and it's a full house. We uh, sold every single ticket. So it's a good news that it's coming from Toronto to, to Montreal. Uh, Derek, I think that we are running out of time. It's a very, very interesting panel, and uh, no, I'll leave it to you to, to close it. Well, I'm very grateful that I had a chance to, to listen to all of this. Uh, I certainly had a crash course in... Uh, running cinema and uh, particularly theaters uh, focusing on this. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's been f- very instructive. I'd like to really thank, first of all, the, uh, the event itself and thank ICCF for the event, but also <laughs> everyone has been contributing beautifully to, to this thing. The quality of this uh, session has been hugely satisfying, so I can't say more than Thank you. Thank you all for thanks for the audience. Thank you also for the occasion. And uh, hey, let's have another. <laughs> Derek, <laughs> thank you so much uh, for moderating our panel. Thank you for friendship. Uh, we know each other for many, many years. Uh, and uh, I hope that you will come back to Toronto now that I'm not coming back to Rome for a while. So thanks again uh, for this incredible uh, uh, panel that we put together and uh, moderating it. Thanks a lot, Derek. Thank you.